I spent most of the time in Berlin, but then as the Nuremberg trials became on schedule, I moved to Nuremberg and uh, lived in the Faber Castle with all the other reporters of the world and covered those trials, which I think were a great advance in the path of mankind towards uh, being a better person. The trial was so thrilling. The documents were so devastating. The Germans are so methodical. They, everything they did, they recorded and signed who was responsible for it, and they saved it. They saved every single document. So the stuff was so fascinating that what occurred in the courtroom was thrilling. I, uh, I, the interest did not lag for one moment. Physically, it was very hard. I was the only CBS reporter, and every show at CBS wanted a, a contribution from Nuremberg. So I was up every day at 6 o'clock to get to the, uh, uh, to the courthouse by 7.30, and uh, then I stayed until late at night. Late at night, the place was empty except for me and a lot of criminals, <laughs> a lot of war criminals and American guards on them. Because of the time difference, the time late difference. at night was our very important morning broadcast. Right, yes. So it was physically hard, but I must say I enjoyed it. I really had a corner on a wonderful story. Did some of the stories break so late that you had to ad-lib them? No, no. Everything, there was plenty of time, a little too much time. It was, it was at that time that Paul White told me I could record early and, and go home. And I did. I recorded several broadcasts and, and went home. Was it, that considered breaking a precedent to allow you I to record? I thought it was, yes. I thought it was. They'd never done it before. But I was terribly overworked. And uh, he realized that, and he said, you record it. Uh, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I record some of these stories. Nothing more was going to happen in the courtroom. What kind of implications do you think, I mean, this was new ground. The first re recorded news piece that I can recall was on D-Day, mm -hmm. Bill Hicks's report. What kind of ground did allowing recordings break open in broadcast news, do you think? I didn't meditate on it very long about the meaning of it. I just knew that I could go home, go, go back and wash. And getting to wash was very hard. Only two bathrooms in this gigantic palace, and there were several hundred reporters standing in line to use them. So uh, I could go home and wash, have a drink, eat a meal, and go to bed early. I didn't care about the implications of it for the future of television or radio. Do you happen to know whether anybody else was allowed to do recordings? By the time that happened, the other two networks had abandoned Nuremberg as being a, a, a story that was... I, I was alone. I had, they had stringers there, but they didn't use them very often. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> then when uh, the case for the prosecution was over and the defense came up, and this famous confrontation between Hermann Goering and our chief prosecutor, Robert Jackson, when they confronted one another, everybody came back. The two ne other networks arrived, and we had our hands full. But at that time, I uh, had a call from Murrow saying he was in, New in London and he wanted to talk to me. Would I come over? And so I got permission to hire a stringer and go to, to London. I thought he was going to tell me, now we're cutting back staff because there's no war anymore. And I want you to know we appreciate what you've done and if there's any uh, 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 future job, we'll call on you. So I went back and we became very close. We. Uh, he brought, his broadcasts were done by dictation. He would walk around the room smoking cigarettes and dictating to his secretary, Kay Campbell. And then we went to his apartment, which later became my apartment, and uh, we sat down and talked and drank and forgot his time. Now, I knew that I could do that, but the world's heavyweight champion shouldn't do that. <laughs> they phoned him from New York and said, you sounded very much like beautiful organ music tonight. <laughs> he didn't show up for the piece. We became close friends, and um, he, what he had to tell me was that uh, he wanted me to take his place as chief European correspondent. I was shocked. I didn't think I was ready for it, but I, I naturally took it and abandoned the Nuremberg trials and settled in London. <laughs>